Thank you, Jeremiah. You pulled it off. He asked me, what message do you want to put across? And I said something about a village. And he was able to do it, so thank you. So, good afternoon and greetings. It's become very cliche, right, to call out agenda slots for speakers. And usually it's something around the effect of I'm standing between you and lunch. But this is a first for me. I'm standing between you and a lot of after parties, happy hour, and the freaking keynote speaker. So anyway, um, welcome to a bridge not too far, right? This is going to be a fun discussion. I've been in here all session, or all summit, I should say. So everybody from Kirsten, Eric, and Catherine, they have knocked it out of the park. And I've reintroduced the term imposter syndrome into my existence. But today's going to be fun, right, this session, because we're going to draw a lot of parallels with historical points in time. And I'm going to attempt to build bridges from those points in time back to cyber uh, insurance. So really looking forward to this. <clears throat> so at the turn of the last century, Ford Motors introduced the automobile. For this conversation and for this story, we're going to just say car, OK? So they introduced the car to the American people. And it did not go well. Didn't go well at all. When people saw the car driving down the street, they were full of anger, venom, and vile. They were throwing rocks at the car. This is a true story. They were throwing rocks at the car and yelling, devil wagon, right? It wasn't going well. It didn't go anywhere near the way Ford thought that it should or would go. So back to the drawing board, right, and the marketing team. What did we do wrong? Why is this greatest innovation, this greatest invention of the last 100 years likely, why is it falling flat? And it turns out that the way the car was marketed to the American people was it was going to be a replacement for their horse, OK? That wasn't a good call. Because back around 1900, the horse was the family pet, right? There was a lot of functionality with the horse, but it really, at the end of the day, was akin to the family dog. So what Ford was doing was saying, get rid of Mr. Ed and buy our car as a replacement. So the new message, the new campaign, was centered on catering to a whole different need, right? Instead of replacing Mr. Ed, the car is going to augment. And it's going to take you places that you've never been, you didn't know that you could even get to. And it's going to fill needs that you didn't realize that you had. And it worked, obviously, right? And so eventually, interesting kind of end to this story, eventually Ford kind of rebranded, again, decades later, rebranded their auto lines. And that's where we come up with cars like Ford, oh, I'm sorry, like Mustang, right? Bronco, and yes, even the Pinto, right? That one didn't go as well, but still, it's a horse. And then how do we measure automotive power? Horsepower, right? So pretty cool, right? So it worked. They got there, right? So you're probably asking, why the story? You haven't even introduced yourself, and you're telling me about cars and horses and trying to tie it back to cyber insurance. Why? What's going on here, OK? So what is going on is not too long ago, right, the thought of acquiring insurance to protect our digital assets was a foreign concept. And, you know, we've heard a lot about that today, right? And everybody in this room, right, to Jeremiah's point, we're the village. There's a lot of choir singing, no doubt. But everybody in the room now, in 2023, has an understanding of what cyber insurance is. There's a lot of nuance that I think we could probably all use a little tuning on but cyber insurance, right? And it's not, it's not just insurance. So my challenge for 
all of those involved in the industry is to do better, be better at explaining, like we've had today, the nuance that comes with cyber insurance, right? Really fully understanding what its purpose is, why you need it, right? We're getting hit over the head continuously on why we need it, but really explaining that nuance, right? And also to be honest, you know, we heard earlier, cyber insurance is not a replacement for a security program, 100%, right? That's true. It's not. But what it is, is a motivator to do better on our part in building our security programs. Right? Okay, so who is this guy? Who am I? Right? So my name is John Carruthers, and I spent 27 years in the FBI. I started my career as the IT guy for the FBI back in the early 90s, and I ended my career as a supervisory special agent out of the San Diego field office. In between, a lot happened, and it was an awesome career. I traveled the globe. I spent time in both Moscow and Kiev, right? So all the geopolitical headlines are really resonating. I spent an entire year in the Netherlands working with the Dutch National Police on cyber criminal matters. It was fantastic, right? I ended my career, like I said, in San Diego, leading our cyber programs there in the FBI office. And I had a gestalt moment that if we truly, as the FBI, want to make an impact on industry and the private sector and really kind of reverse the, the, the threat or have an effect positive on everybody here, we really needed to move as far left of boom as we could. I cheekily coined it left of click back then, but I'll just stick with boom now. But how far left of boom can we get? And the way the FBI, the way I, the way I saw the conundrum was we needed to be out there, I needed to be out in industry talking and sharing threat intelligence and sharing all intelligence that we had and putting it in the hands of the people that could use it and not be so possessive, right? And so what I did was I spoke a lot to companies, to conferences, to CFOs, C CISOs, CTOs. I spoke to everybody I could to try to do this, okay? And it's kind of working. It's continued. After I retired in 2019, the FBI still, in cyber, is making a real effort on pushing threat intelligence out to us in industry. So like I said, in 2019, I retired and I went to work at Illumina. Illumina is a big biotech in San Diego. And for those that don't know, kind of an interesting fact, Illumina is the tech behind the genetic sequencing 23andMe. Right, so I'm not a scientist, I was in corporate, but I just thought that was kind of a neat deal. After Illumina, I found or adopted my true work family, and that's where I'm currently an executive vice president and CISO at Trident Group, who can best be described as a company and an organization and a provider loaded with super talent, and we truly are integrating security solutions. And so what I'm doing is I'm building the security practice and I'm focused on virtual CISO, tabletop exercises, which we've talked about a lot today, program assessments, privacy readiness, and really everything that we've kind of categorized under the cyber insurance umbrella and how it ties back to security. So that's what I do. And so we can talk after this how I can maybe help you, right? Oh, and the... The Hack IQ logo, that was an LLC that I built towards the end of my FBI career for the sole purpose of pushing threat intelligence out to all the audiences that I've added to my Rolodex through these types of interactions. So let me ask you, is, is cyber insurance a compliance play? Or is it a safety net? 
or is it neither, right? <clears throat> when you double click on compliance, you see a lot of tentacles leading back to the topic of cyber insurance, right? And more specifically, what cyber insurance demands of its customers, right, and its clients. As a CISO, and a virtual CISO, I converse every day in compliance. Like that's almost a, a bilingual ability to speak to compliance and all of the tentacles that we see here. And when I look at these functions in this graph, I feel like I could, or we could, swap out the word compliance for cyber insurance to a degree, right? Which is interesting because now GRC is coming in more and more and more into our lives <clears throat> as professionals in the security industry. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, how do we measure these functions? Right? How does an underwriter like Catherine do that? And she did a much better job of articulating that process than I'm gonna attempt to do right now, but I will say that that is a challenge, right? How do we measure our security success? How do we apply a KPI or a key performance indicator to something like transparency? That's tough. And so I don't know the answer, but I just throw it out there, right? See what sticks. I would say cyber insurance is a business play. It's an enterprise play. Today's threatscape mandates that our enterprise leaders hedge their bets to a degree, right? Because no matter how talented your team or how best in class your tool stack is, I can tell you from my time in the FBI and what everybody before me on this stage has said today, that if you have a sophisticated actor from a nation state or somebody throwing sophisticated TTPs at your network and they want your network or they want your data, they're going to get in, I can tell you that. And so when that happens, now we as the enterprise, we as the victim, the target, are left to deal with untold numbers of compliance, regulatory, privacy, legal requirements, right? And all of that costs money, i.e. hedging of our bets, right? And so speaking of security, I told you, this is a, there is no flow to this presentation. So just enjoy. So speaking of security, let's play a game of nodding our heads in agreement as we read a series of security and insurance related quotes throughout history, okay? There are several quotes before you now that may resonate and others may have you scratching your chin going, what the heck is that quote and who said it? When Ben Franklin said distrust and caution are the parents of security, I would almost ask, did he have a crystal ball in front of him when he said that, right? I love that he said that, I love that quote. Or when John Lilly said, Out of <clears throat> our only security is our ability to change. I would translate that as our ability to adapt. Another talking point that we've heard a lot today and we're gonna hear again a lot throughout not only this conversation but probably the week, right? And I think it was right on point. Now the other quotes, I'm not gonna go over each one, but they kind of feed something I wanna go back to in my FBI days. Whenever I spoke from the FBI lectern or with an FBI badge, I did not, I purposely did not engage in fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? Something we call FUD, right? I was very FUD free, as it were. Um, I had a colleague just recently tell me, well, he thought it was fear, uncertainty, and disaster. And I'm like, yeah, that probably applies too. We could use that. But just by being from the FBI and walking into a room with an audience, they were expecting FUD and they would quickly shut down, and my message would get lost. So my approach 
was, again, to demystify what we were doing in the FBI to help you, the American people, in securing your organizations and your programs. Right? That was my goal. That was my mission that I referred to earlier. And so when I spoke, there were, you would hear a lot of, it's going to be OK. right? <laughs> we're going to work with you. We're going to share intelligence. We're going to declassify data and information to make your jobs more current, more relevant. Now, if I say all of that because if I were to engage in FUD, I would certainly want to bring Bruce Schneier, an American scientist, with me. Right? If you look at the top left, and you have somebody saying things like, you cannot defend, you cannot prevent, the only thing you can do is detect and respond, that's a scary fuddy statement. right? I mean, there's, there, there might be some truth to that, but I prefer to take the optimistic side of things and say that we can do those things within reason. Right? And so I would always channel, again, if I were to go, the, go to the dark side and engage in FUD, I would just channel Bruce. In 2013, I found out that I was going to be a parent for the first time. I was a parent-to-be. So I went out and I bought the book on the right. right. I had recently read a study that said parents-to-be that buy books on parenting become better parents. So I had that going for me. I also have a weird like of cool flannel shirts. And I like to hike and wear backpacks. So the book on the right was the one for me. And I was going to be a parent and I wanted to be a good parent. Right. What I found out later was that, no, that was not accurate. It's not the book that makes the parent to be a better parent. It's the motivation, it's the want on that pending parent to be a good parent. It's what made them go to the bookstore in the first place or go to Amazon, right? It's, that's what made them good parents, not the actual book, OK? And so that was interesting. And now, kind of as a sidebar, if you today ask my 10-year-old girl if daddy's a good parent, you're likely going to get something around like daddy needs to go back and buy another book. But um, that's a whole separate story for a whole separate day. Anyway, when you, s <clears throat> when you sign on for cyber insurance, you're not automatically crowned a security champion. But you are adding to your security tool set and your stack, right? And rounding out your security program, and that speaks with volume, in my opinion. So there's the parallel, right? Parenting book and cyber insurance. Stay with me. Now let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> what I call the minimum mandatory controls version 2023. We've seen in two of the previous discussions, some variation of this. And it, it's a good validating discussion to have. Right? I'm glad that I added this to this discussion, to this conversation. But the version number, version 2023, to me is key. Right? Because what is a, a required, a minimum mandatory security control today might not be so tomorrow or next year. Okay. And it's important to know that and remember that and not rely on one list and think it's a static list and, and, and not dynamic. Because this really is what feeds our need to stay current on intelligence, news, and peer sharing. Right? The cyber security or security industry is a very incestuous village. And so I would challenge any of us, no matter where you are in this country or the world, I would challenge you to not be able to find a local peer help group of like-minded security professionals. Right? So keep that in mind. <clears throat> the list you see here is, again, like I said earlier, hopefully a lot like singing to the choir. Right? This list was provided to me from a broker friend of mine, and this is what they use 
when helping make determinations on things like, are you a suitable customer for our underwriters in their insur or their, our carriers in their insurance that they provide? Right? There's a lot of oldies but goodies. I would imagine that MFA, patch management, IR planning, and awareness training will always be on a list like this. But I would ask, would supply chain management have been on a minimum mandatory list four years ago before solar winds? I don't know the answer, because I wasn't given this talk four years ago. But I think I have an idea, right? So one new thought with regards to a minimum mandatory list like this is, as the cyber insurance industry attempts to price <clears throat> Uh, price the market, like they're in a tough spot, right? They don't have historical data the way they do with life insurance and auto insurance. You can go back generations and pull data and come up with a very precise price point for those types of insurance. But for cyber, they don't have that. It might feel like we've been in this industry for a long time and for some of us we have, but really, it, relatively speaking, it's not that long. And so what can they do? Well, they can generate a list of minimum mandatory requirements. Hey, you need to be doing this, this, that, and this, right? So in the absence of tangible data points, we end up with something like this, and we can use this as security professionals and professionals in general to help mature all of our programs. Do these things, and you will not only be on the nice list, but you will also be on the path to cybersecurity maturity, right? I, as a VC, so I use this list every day when I work with my clients. For me, it's the security north star, right? It helps me keep the conversation on point, and the strategy, more importantly, on point and the risk reduction conversation much more focused if I can have a list like this to reference. Okay, more history. So when the elevator was first introduced, it was controlled by a human operator, right? We've all seen the, the elevator operator, the elevator doorman. Typically, this was going to be a man in the elevator who would interact with the passenger, maybe tell some stories, push the buttons that were requested to be pushed, you know, typically floor numbers, right? This is not that sophisticated. But that's how the elevator was rolled out to society, right? Had a middleman. As technology and the labor market changed, the realization that we don't need a middleman on this elevator became a reality. And so in a sense, the operator got pushed out. Right? See what I did there? I used the word push. So, right, I thought that was pretty good. Anyway, so he got pushed out, phased out, and now all of us, the passengers, were expected to get on the elevator by ourselves and ride solo without any intervention. We were expected to push the button. So what do you think happened when this change took place? Nobody got on the elevator. They were afraid. They didn't have the accompaniment of an operator on the elevator to help them. They were afraid to ride solo, which kind of feeds my belief that at all of our cores, right, we're chickens at heart, right? But that's, again, a different conversation. But we would not get on the elevator because we didn't trust how it was going to work. So what did the elevator companies do? What got introduced? The voice, right? Going up, going down. Floor 10, right? floor 3. 
When that voice was introduced into the elevator, people got back on the elevator, right? So there was some adaptation, right, in the rollout of this technology to build comfort into the consumer. So sometimes all we need in the security space is the comfort to adapt, right? Back to that John Lilly quote. The journey may change, but the destination will remain the same. <clears throat> so what does cyber insurance ultimately provide its customers? Right? And so the story that I'll tell here is in the 1930s, the Great Depression was gripping the nation. Right? We all know about the Great Depression. But when you peel the onion and you double click a little bit, there's even more to it and like some of the, the consequences of what was happening. Banks were failing, causing people a great amount of panic and fear and a reluctance to put their money in those failing banks. Totally understandable. I don't think I would have done that, right? They were afraid to deposit their money in failing banks. And so what that meant to society was a complete stoppage and near paralysis of our economy because it was already fledgling and there was no money flowing through the economy now. That's a problem. And that really fed the Great Depression to a degree. So what happened? We needed intervention. We needed somebody, some, something needed to restore the trust right, in the people. Because at this point, the people, what are they doing with their money? Instead of putting it in the banks. It's going into mason jars, right? You've heard about that. It's going under mattresses, okay? Like, that's why. But not a great return on investment, not a great interest rate in those two vehicles, but still better than losing all of your money in a failing bank. So what happened? What did we have to do? So we had a good amount of panic, we needed to panic-proof this situation. So the US government stood up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC, right? With the caveat, we want you, American consumer, to put your, or citizen, to put your money back in our banks, and if anything happens, we, the government, are gonna pay you back up to $250,000. Right? Panic proofing. They were panic proofing the American people. And that's still in play today, right? The FDIC, we still all probably look for that. When we, or we, if we don't look for it, we see it when we drive by a bank. Now, some would say that with today's global economy and the currency and the fact that we had digital currency and Bitcoin and all various types of currency that maybe the panic proofing is not quite as effective today as it was back in the Great Depression. Again, different discussion. <clears throat> but cyber insurance was the result of kind of pending panic, right? Across industry, it's meant to panic proof organizations and remove the hopelessness that's caused by the drumbeat of cyber breaches, incidents, data theft, privacy concerns, right? There's a lot of panic out there that cyber insurance is trying to solve for, or at least psychologically make us feel better. And so that's it, that's my history lesson, right? Never taught a class in my life, but here you guys are the lucky recipients of this history lesson <clears throat> and bridge building to the cyber insurance industry. Now, there will be no quiz, although I know that you guys would pass it with flying colors. Uh, there will be an opportunity uh, to engage um, in further dialogue. You know, we've seen it happen here either with questions while I'm on stage or I can step over here, not a problem, or I can hopefully maybe see some of you at an after party or um, 
a drone hunt, I believe is what's happening downstairs, as I've been told. <clears throat> Regardless, um, but I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here to answer questions, sign autographs. Maybe I'll just stay here and receive your thunderous applause. Either way. Um, but seriously, I would love to assist anybody in here if your company or your program needs consultation on, on how to reasonably move through the morass that is trying to solve the, the, the cyber insurance conundrum, let me be that person for you. So with that, I say thank you and appreciate you. <laughs>